Welcome, you guys. It's good to see you guys here this morning. If you guys are ready to worship and you'd like to stand, you can. And you can sit or stand as we uh, continue in worship as you feel led. Before we start, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this beautiful new day that you've given us. We thank you for every person that you have brought into this place this morning. We thank you for uh, those who are joining us online and uh, just... We thank you for the body, Lord, for the encouragement that you give us through our brothers and sisters, through uh, just time talking to each other and uh, fellowshipping, praying with each other. And so I pray, God, that you would uh, continue to knit our hearts together during this time of worship, Lord, as we hear uh, the people around us singing, Lord, and we just know that we are entering your throne room together. And I pray that we would do so with gladness, that you would give us hearts of thanksgiving that we would enter your courts with praise. And uh, so we just give you this time. We pray that you be magnified and glorified, that our uh, offering would be sweet to you, and, um, and just that you would uh, be lifted on our own, in our own hearts and our own minds, Lord, that you would glorify yourself in us. And so we just give you this time, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not My failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness
you're the only right among the wrong. You're the only hope among the chaos. You are the voice that calls me on. Louder than every lie, my sword in every fight, the truth will chase away the night. Cause your name is power over darkness.
song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other Jesus, the only one that could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
we praise you. We thank you for being the solid rock that we stand on, Lord. We know that no matter what is happening in the world around us, and, and it's not getting less crazy and unstable, Lord, and there can be a lot of fear that is attached uh, just to the events going on around us, but we know, Lord, that we have a firm foundation in you, that, that the thoughts that you think to us are for good, that you have a future and a hope for us, and so we just thank you for that, Lord, and we pray that as we just sang, that we would build our lives on you, on your love, on the knowledge of what you've done for us, Lord, that that would be what sustains us, Lord, that we would press into you, that we would draw closer to you, that we would be uh, just students of your word, that we would know what it is that you uh, desire of us, Lord, that we would seek after your guidance and your wisdom, and just that in everything that we do, we would be closer to you, that we'd be more like you. And so we just give you this time in your word, and we pray that you would speak through Pastor Brett by your spirit, that you would speak to our hearts this morning, Lord, that you would uh, just imprint it upon us, Lord, that it would leave a lasting mark and that we would learn from it. And so we just give you this time and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, greet each other. Good morning, everybody. Wow. Sweet music to a pastor's ears, right? Fellowship and family. Uh, as I was uh, scanning the room, lots of new faces, uh, lots of old faces as well. well. Wait a second, that's not how you say that. <laughs> no, I meant, I was just joking when I said that. I knew what I meant. I just wanted to make fun of you, but Familiar faces, old friends, family here, uh, and I want to encourage you guys to uh, be encouraged this morning, be refreshed. If you have not asked, just felt uh, as we were worshiping, if you have not asked for a, a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit, you know, Paul, Paul says to us uh, that we should be, the literal Greek is be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, right, and it just, it, it's just it's all you have to do is ask. It's a, it's a request of faith. You trust the goodness of your Father. Uh, you can ask for the Holy Spirit, and I encourage you to do that. If you've never been, uh, and listen, as a as a church, we're baptized into the family of Christ. We are uh, filled with the Spirit. We're baptized in the Spirit in that sense. But then there's also the empowering of the Holy Spirit uh, to help us live this life for Christ. Uh, can't do it on our own, and uh, there's an enabling power. Uh, to live for him, uh, to love others, to obey, to follow him, to trust him. Uh, you need, man, we need that, right? You need the Holy Spirit. If you have not asked for a fresh filling, if you've never asked, definitely ask for uh, the baptism, the empowering of the Holy Spirit uh, in your life. Uh, let's do that right now. Uh, all of us need to ask. So all of us, whether it's the first time or you've done it number of, numerous times, uh, let's do it again. Father, uh, right now, Lord, uh, just before you, Lord, you're so generous. You're so good, uh, Lord. And, and I want you to do, ask this. It's not You don't need me to pray for you. You need to ask. Uh, it's a personal request. So as I'm praying for you, would you pray? Would you ask for a filling, for an empowerment of the Holy Spirit? Uh, do that right now personally. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for uh, that, just the leading of the Holy Spirit, uh, encouraging for you, uh, refreshing for us. Uh, let's turn to the uh, bulletin this morning. I want to invite you to be a part of some things. Lots of things going on and uh, lots of opportunities to plug in, to connect, to uh, share in friendship and fellowship, to be a blessing to one another, to serve. Uh, lots of things going on. We want you to be connected. We need you to be connected. Uh, as you open it up, uh, as you open up your bulletin, uh, seems like today's a good day for a kickball game, isn't it? Uh, the youth are having a kickball. It's, a, it's beautiful out there. It's supposed to get rain later on tonight, but uh, today is beautiful. And a uh, perfect day for this youth kickball event. Uh, so you can see the details for that uh, and uh, encourage you, all the youth to be a part of this. There's flyers out in the lobby. You can ask the youth as well. Uh, but anyways, uh, youth kickball event, chicken tender day. Uh, it starts after church, 1215. 4 o'clock, they're going to be at Sheffield Park, it is uh, over in Oldsmar, I believe. Uh, also, tonight, the prayer meeting, I want to encourage you with the prayer meeting tonight, 
uh, at 6.30. Uh, we do this on a weekly basis, uh, unless special events, and we'll note that in a second. Uh, but tonight, uh, Pastor Jose heads this up, and really a blessing, really encouraging as he prays uh, with you guys that are, are here, but prays for the needs of the fellowship, prays for uh, what the Lord's doing, and for the uh, the different challenges that we face. You know, I should mention, you know, there's a lot of uh, people here that are recovering, recovering from uh, different surgeries, uh, some people going through cancer treatments. Uh, we have people that are, are uh, at, a, at a place in life where uh, the, their uh, loved ones are passing. Uh, uh, the Schwemleys, his, uh, Greg Schwemley's father passed away last night. Um, uh, ben Floor, Pastor Ben, Pastor Ben's up in Gainesville teaching today uh, at Calvary Chapel Gainesville, so you can pray for that. Uh, and, uh, but his family has gone through. His wife's uh, father passed away last week. Uh, th this week, his wife's stepmother passed away. Uh, and then Ben's grandmother, uh, kind of a matriarch of the family, uh, passed away. So Ben is heading up to uh, uh, his family for the funeral memorial services for his grandmother uh, this week. Just a lot of things like that going on. So be in prayer for one another. And that's why the prayer meeting is so important. I encourage you. We want to be a people of prayer. In fact, let me encourage you with this. Before you leave today, pray for your needs, right? Lift these things, these things up to the Lord, not only personally, but would you share that in fellowship? Uh, uh, catch one of your friends, somebody that you know, a familiar face. Uh, if you uh, want a pastor to pray for you, we'll be up here after the service. But before you leave, make sure that we're uh, a people that are praying with and for one another. Uh, let's practice that in fellowship. Uh, so I want to encourage you with the prayer meetings. Uh, now, uh, also coming up, going down the list, Moms Meetup, uh, an every Wednesday event at 10 a.m. It's at John Chestnut Park. This is an ongoing opportunity. Uh, Andy Bentley, uh, her email listed there. Uh, she's just joined us with the kids' ministry, but she's been with us uh, in fellowship for a long time, and uh, uh, she's heading this up. So Moms with Kids, a uh, great time to get together and for your kids to play and for you to have fellowship. Uh, John Chestnut Park, weekly, 10 a.m. at uh, Wednesdays. Uh, next, you can see uh, Men's First Wednesday Lunch. We're already in, stepping into February, first uh, Wednesday of the month. Uh, guys, grab your lunch, and we uh, share in fellowship here in the church lobby. Uh, good time to update and to pray for one another. I uh, encourage you to be here for that. Uh, again, uh, this Wednesday at noon uh, here in the church lobby. Super Bowl party. Now, there's debate on how often we've done this. I don't remember having a Super Bowl party. Maybe early on we had some. Uh, lots of you have had your own personal Super Bowl parties, but apparently you know, there, there's a team that's uh, close and near and dear to many of you, me included. Uh, the Bucks are in the Super Bowl, and so we're going to have a Super Bowl party. Uh, some of the uh, guys on staff requested it, and so they're going to be doing that. So I uh, encourage you to be a part of it. Uh, if, if you're uh, like me, and this is a struggle, I'm going to sacrifice and I'm going to do my best to be here, but I'm the kind of guy that likes to watch my football by myself uh, and maybe a few close people that can deal with me. But, uh, you know, because I can get real emotional and I don't want you to see that. So I'll have to be restrained. <laughs> so, yeah, so if you're that kind of person, I understand if you, if you really can't. But I, really, I kind of want to push. I'm going to be here. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm kind of pushing you to be here as well. Super Bowl party. So it's on Super Bowl day. Go figure. Next Sunday. Uh, we're going to start at 5.30. Uh, encourage you to bring uh, some Super Bowl side dishes, that kind of stuff to, to share in, and, and uh, the church will be providing uh, some food. I don't know what, but we'll have some food to share as well. So kind of a potluck, uh, and uh, we'll get some pizzas and other things, and you bring what you want to bring. Uh, and we're going to have some games set up. And if you don't like football, you come anyway. There's fellowship. We'll have things set up to, to do and places to, to uh, uh, encourage one another in fellowship. So... Yeah, Super Bowl party. All right. I don't know if we'll do one next year. I don't think we'll be here. But anyways, uh, uh, I don't know. Can Tom Brady get out there on a walker? I don't know if he can uh, hang out long enough. But anyways, next, uh, Children's Valentine, Valentine Craft Day uh, coming up Thursday, February 11th uh, here at the church. Uh, again, moms, kids, a uh, good time to fellowship together and be encouraged in Christ, uh, in the love of Christ. Uh, so again, February 11th here at the church, 10 uh, to 1130. Uh, Sign-ups out there on the table, information out there on the table. Marriage Fellowship uh, coming up. We do this once a month. Uh, this month, Friday, February the 12th, it's at the home of the Negris, and you can see all the details listed for that. Uh, there's information, sign-up out there, uh, address, flyers out there, and so forth uh, on the sign-up sign -up table. A uh, great place to refresh and encourage other marriages as well. Uh, inductive Bible Study Workshop. Uh, this is just a, a, a process, a strategy, a, a way to approach the Bible, studying the Bible. 
Uh, we're going to do the how-to on a Friday night. You can see uh, coming up at the end of February, uh, we're going to do the how-to on Friday night, uh, the 26th. And then Saturday morning, we're going to put it into practice. Uh, if, you wanna, if you've never been, you want to go on Friday night. Uh, if you have been to the Bible study workshop, you can come Saturday and join us. Uh, it's fun to do it together. We're going to have tables set up, and uh, it's uh, just a shared experience. It's very exciting, very uh, encouraging. Uh, so if you haven't been through or if you want a refresher, you can come Friday night. And then Saturday, uh, we're going to set it up, and uh, we're going to do it all together. Uh, we uh, have some uh, information for that, uh, some, some uh, booklets that we put together. Uh, we're also going to have lunch together, so the cost for this is $10 uh, to cover those things. Uh, so look forward to that. Next, you can see that same day, the youth conference, Calvary Chapel Brandon uh, is set this, up, set this up. So uh, it happens to be that same day, but it's going to be a good time for the youth as well. Uh, so you can check the information out on that uh, for uh, uh, being a part of the youth conference over at Calvary Chapel Brandon. Uh, Monday night, home fellowship starting up uh, in, in uh, uh, what is this? I thought I read this and then I didn't. Uh, Monday night, I, I thought it was a different one, but uh, Monday night, Home Fellowship, Jim Borland, uh, you're starting in Matthew. Where's Jim? What do I need to say here? <laughs> starting a new book, Monday night, Home Fellowship, Jim Borland. My eyes are like the, the lights and I can't read this and I'm nervous and everything and, and I'm thrown at Jim and he's like, what? Like, throne of lifeline, help me out. <laughs> Monday night, home fellowship. Uh, Palm Harbor, uh, Jim's uh, a great teacher, his wife uh, as well. And uh, as they uh, uh, have a group, they, he's great at bringing in friends and, and uh, neighbors. And he's just very uh, out, great outreach and evangelistic. Uh, and uh, just a great home fellowship to be a part of. So Monday night, starting a new book, Book of Matthew. Uh, and uh, you'll be blessed. All right, then at the bottom, you can see the kids' ministry. Wednesday nights, we're going to start back up, starting in March. Uh, we need help with that. Uh, would love for you to join that team, uh, help out uh, with uh, the kids that are here, and as well, reach out to new families and new kids uh, for Wednesday night. So check that out. You can contact uh, those in the kids' ministry if you want to be a part of that, and uh, all of us be in prayer for that. All right. You can tuck your bullets in a way. Sorry for my silliness. encourage you to hold on to it, though. Read it, review it as you leave. Kind of make a habit of revisiting the front, visit the uh, sign-ups and the flyers, get information. Oh, and my wife. My wife has an announcement. It, what is it? Oh, yeah, a handful. The, the, we got word that the uh, camp for the ladies' retreat, uh, Camp Kalakwa, uh, is extending our deadline for the ladies' retreat. Uh, so we have opportunity to open up to the last handful of spots for the ladies' retreat. Uh, so there's a handful left. You can see my wife, uh, Holly, right back there, or Barbara Borland right over here, uh, and uh, we're excited about that. Uh, we also have scholarships available. So really, there's, there shouldn't be anything that gets in your way. Uh, ladies, uh, uh, important, especially in this time, this season. We need fellowship. We need encouragement. Uh, the ladies uh, praying and, and meeting, uh, planning this uh, ladies' retreat, and you want to be a part of it. So a handful of spots left. See my wife and see Barbara Borland as we have extended uh, from the camp uh, some uh, time to uh, register some more ladies. All right, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to be in the book of Revelation, chapter 19. If I ever get through all this other stuff. Uh, Revelation chapter 19 a little bit, but 1 Peter chapter 5 first. And uh, if, you have a, if you don't have a Bible in your lap, not your spouse's lap, but your lap, if you have one on your phone, that's fine. That's, I use that a lot, my, personally. Uh, so if you need a Bible, if you don't have one, wave at me, and the ushers will bring you a Bible. Everybody good? All right, 1 Peter chapter 5. Now, we're going to be looking at the uh, section that we've been visiting quite a bit. Uh, it uh, begins in verse 5 of chapter 5, uh, and it goes on through verse 11. And so you can be looking at that as I make some comments. As we uh, 
are in a crazy time, in a season that's uh, really uh, going nuts and things are out of control and it's, it's questionable what's going to happen next. And, uh, you know, it just seems like uh, a time where um, it's very uncertain, unsettling. Uh, it's really good to be here, right? It's really good to be here in fellowship. It's good to be a believer. It's good to have a solid rock to stand upon, Jesus Christ, his word. It's good to have confidence in him. Uh, this world is difficult. It's hard. There's crazy stuff going on. Uh, and, and to stand upon Christ, the old hymn that I've been referring to a lot, uh, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, right? So it's good to be here. I'm reminded of the image. Do you remember the story of the uh, Exodus when the plagues are falling on Egypt? Judgment is coming on Egypt. God wants them to release his children, the Israelites, uh, and they won't do it. The Pharaoh won't do it. And so judgment's coming on Egypt. And while that's all happening, uh, more than once we see that the Jewish peoples uh, uh, are separate from that. And that, like when it's dark in Egypt, the sun is shining uh, in Israel. Uh, they're guarded. There's a sense of uh, just the, the security that they have in God. There's a similar experience that we have as believers. Uh, we have that experience where oh, we go through difficult things. There are hard things happening in our lives. Uh, but the reminder of Scripture is that uh, we have a hope in Christ. Our destiny is different. Our experience is different. In fact, uh, when we see what's, how Scripture describes eternal life, Eternal life begins in knowing God and knowing Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it, that's where it begins. It begins at the moment of faith. When you trust in the Lord, you come out of death and you move into life. And it, for Christians, uh, there's a stark contrast. We're experiencing life. Uh, we're experiencing that freedom in Christ. Uh, we know those things. And so as you experience that freedom and as you experience uh, the joy, the security, uh, the uncertainties removed, peace is brought forward. Stability uh, is established in our lives. Uh, that's the reality of what we have. Uh, now, as you consider that, uh, Jesus uh, in his ministries, he told uh, the religious elite, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the priests of the day, uh, he, he scolded them. And he said, you can tell the weather, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, but you can tell the weather. It's actually in Matthew 16, if you're curious. Uh, but you can tell the weather you can see the signs in the skies, and you can put out a forecast, but you can't tell the, the signs of the times, and they're missing the Messiah that's right in front of them. They're missing Jesus Christ right in front of them, and, and he's saying, I, I don't know how it's possible. You do something simple, you can go out there and look at the clouds and say it's going to rain or not, but you don't see me right in front of you, and he scolds them for not recognizing his time. There's a, simp a similar experience that we're in right now. Uh, listen, God, Jesus tells people, you should, you should recognize the sign of the times, the season that you're in. In Luke, he gets even more uh, direct. After Palm Sunday, what we call Palm Sunday, he comes down, he's received by the, the crowds, but the religious elite, again, refuse that. They, they accept him as king in the, in the moment. The, the crowds are accepting him as king, but the religious elite stop and say, Jesus, you need to tell them to stop doing this. And he says, listen, if they don't do it, the rocks will cry out. He comes into Jerusalem and he weeps over Jerusalem because they're, that moment they're, they're not seeing him. Right? The religious elite are pushing against him, refusing and rejecting him in that moment. And he literally says, if you would have known this day and it's very specific, right? It's not just a day general. If you would, in this time, it's literally that day. And if you know your scriptures, that's a specific day proclaimed by prophecy, that day when Christ would be received as king. If you would have known this day, but you rejected it. He wanted to gather them like a mother hen gathers her chicks, but they refused. And in that moment when he w wanted to be there for them, they wouldn't be there. They refused them, right? So there's this encouragement, this, even this brokenness that Christ has when he sees that they don't recognize the time that they're in. Do you recognize the time that you're in right now? Are you paying attention? Peter would tell us in his, his following book, in 2 Peter at the end of it, uh, he begins to describe the end and how 
there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, but the, all these things are going to burn, right? All these things that we invest in, all these things that we're putting our time in, all this that we've saved up and purchased and the things that we're building and the plans that we have, all these things are going to burn. The Lord's coming back. The Lord's going to establish his kingdom. And Peter's comment there is, in light of this, what manner of people ought we to be? And, and note when Peter says, Peter said that 2,000 years ago, and it applied even back then. Uh, here's what we know. We're getting closer. Uh, I joke at times saying, or some of you laugh at me for saying it, but we're one day closer. We know that. Uh, but we also have signs. God told us in the end, you're going to start to see these things. We're seeing these things. Uh, Peter has warned the church, told the church, taught the church. Listen, in light of this, this is where it's headed. This is where it's going. There's going to be a day where judgment comes and, and God's going to establish his kingdom. In light of this, what manner of people ought we to be? And, and do you hear that personally? Are you hearing that personally today? What really matters? What's really important? What are you giving your life to? How are you living? What, what are you spending your effort, your time, your energy, your finance? What are you giving to? You know, all those things. In light of the, the reality of where we're headed, and the reality that recognizing the season that we're in, what manner of people ought we to be? The writer of Hebrews later would say uh, that we're to cling to Christ, that we're to uh, um, hold fast. That's the phrase. Hold fast to Christ, right? Hold fast to the confession because he's trustworthy. He's true. And then he says, and you ought to stir up love. Consider one another that you might stir up love and good works in each other's lives. Consider, think about each other, stirring up love and good works and not forsaking the assembling together, fellowship, serving one another. And then he says, and so much more as you see the day approaching. You can see it, right? Right, in light of that, the proximity of where we're at, right, in light of that, what manner of people? How are we living? Are, are, are we giving ourselves more and more to the things of Christ, fellowship and serving? Now, Peter comes along in the midst of this, and there's just, you know, the, the phrasing of this. Maybe you've been skimming this already. Looking at verse 5, uh, you can see uh, this encouragement uh, given to us. It closes with this uh, phrase, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Uh, we're going to do that in a moment, and we're going to encourage you to be a people like this uh, in this time, in this season. Uh, it, it, Peter continues in verse 8, and he says, Be sober, right? Be clear minded, uh, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Right? You take a roaring lion seriously. <laughs> you don't play games. Uh, he is uh, something you need to pay attention to. All right, that's the sense of this. Verse 9, resist him. Resist him. Steadfast in the faith. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Uh, the reality that we experience difficulty. You're going through hardships. Uh, Paul would remind you in his writings in Romans uh, that he's considered the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared to the, uh, the, the glory of God that shall be revealed in us. What we're going to experience in heaven, uh, it'll cause us to just lay down all the issues of suffering uh, that it have wounded us and hurt. They just lay it down because the glory of God, the healing, the restoration of God is going to be so amazing. In verse 10 of this, 1 Peter chapter 5, he says this, but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. In such a time as this, right, you're, we face difficulties. There's many in this church that are suffering. All of our stories have suffering, uh, things that we've gone through that are hard and difficult. Uh, but there's a day coming. 
right? When we're going to see him face to face and restoration. And even right now, as we're waiting upon that day, the ministry of God, the ministry of Jesus Christ, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, how much you need this, how much I need this, that God would perfect. That means to mature you, to equip you, to complete you, right? Perfect you, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. And I love the imagery of that, right? To calm us down like a mother calms her child. That God would do that even right now. What manner of people ought we to be? Well, let's take a moment to pray. In light of what we have going on all around us and in our lives and what we see, uh, the clouds on the horizon, the weather that we can predict, but the times that we're in as well, right? In light of that, let's humble ourselves, right? Let's cry out to him. Let's cast our cares upon him. Let's ask the Lord to do this work in us even right now. Would you pray? Uh, would you bring your heart, your life, your struggles, what you're dealing with, bring that to the Lord. Uh, cast your cares upon him. Take this seriously. Ask the Lord to do this work in your life. Uh, you pray. You talk to the Lord right now. Lord, we are thankful to be here. We're thankful that uh, we're not only here with other believers, uh, the family of God, but you're here. And we're in your presence, that you've made a way for us to experience you, that you willingly pour out uh, your Holy Spirit, that you bring uh, comfort in the ministry. Uh, Lord, you establish us, you perfect us, you settle us. Lord, we need that. Uh, Lord, we need you to grow us and mature us. Lord, we need equipping for this time. Lord, so much of Scripture speaks of these days that we live in. Uh, Lord, and, and so many people are unaware. Lord, you, would you cause us to be very aware? Lord, and not troubled by these things, but mature about these things. Lord, approaching these with the awareness, but the, the faith to turn to you. Lord, we turn to you. We cast our cares upon you. Lord, we want to be your vessels, your ambassadors. We want to live for you in these times. Lord, would you pour out your spirit? Would you empower us? Would you help us? Uh, Lord, would you give us your peace? Would you minister to the, the bride of Christ, the church? Would you minister your love even right now? Lord, uh, it's so good in this moment to know that you are the shepherd of our souls. Lord, that you know the needs of this room. Uh, each heart, those watching, you know. Lord, would you shepherd the hearts here? Uh, guide and direct. Uh, and again, pour out your love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, just a little bit toward the back of the book, almost to the very end of the book, Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. We come out of Revelation chapter 17 and 18, and we've seen the fall of Babylon. Uh, and it's, it, it should be noted here that it's intricately connected. You cannot separate the two. The fall of Babylon is needed and connected to uh, the bringing forth of the new Jerusalem. Uh, the saving of the Jewish people, uh, the bringing forth of the bride of Christ, it is all predicated on that. The fall of ba Babylon has to occur. It, it is not a separate, divided uh, reality. It's going to happen. The fall of Babylon is going to occur. And then what you're going to see is the establishment of the kingdom. Uh, New Jerusalem, the Messiah is going to come and rule and reign. The Jewish people uh, will turn to Christ. The, the bride of Christ will be introduced. All these things are happening because the defeat of the Antichrist and his system has occurred. It's interconnected. Uh, the chapters are placed way later. You know, when they wrote the Bible, the chapters weren't there. Uh, the verses weren't there. We added them later, and we're thankful for them. Uh, but sometimes they cause us to lose the context. And you want to remember that this is just a flow from 18 to 19. It's continuing. Uh, now, as we go into this chapter, 
there is so much going on, so much information, so much that we could uh, stop and, and consider some of the different aspects, the different backgrounds, uh, the background information. Uh, there are some separate studies that we could do. Uh, and I'm going to approach it on this, uh, from this place. We're going to uh, go through this chapter today, uh, Lord willing. And uh, as we go through this chapter, uh, I'm going to do some uh, uh, kind of uh, appendix or some background or some uh, uh, take uh, some time to look at some of the different aspects of this chapter. Uh, so in the weeks to come, we might be able to do that. Uh, there's things here that are dealt with, things like the Bema Seat. Uh, that's the, the, the seed of judgment before Jesus. Separate and different from the great white throne judgment, the Bema seat is not a judgment of sin. Uh, it's the place where reward is given uh, for uh, what you've done in Christ, in grace. Uh, reward is given to the church, to the believers, the Bema seat judgment. Uh, it's significantly important uh, looking at this chapter. So we might uh, be able to take some time and just look specifically at the Bema seat in weeks to come. Or I encourage you, to do a study on your own of, of that as well, looking at the word and inviting the Holy Spirit to direct you. Uh, but again, Lord willing, we'll look at that separately. Uh, another aspect of this uh, that is something that we'll consider looking at is uh, the aspect of the uh, bride of Christ in the marriage of the church to Christ. And uh, the ways that uh, in the Jewish culture, the, uh, the uh, culture of the Jewish wedding uh, at the time of Christ, uh, the, the ways that that lines up and points to the Jewish wedding points to the marriage of the church to Christ, and so much of that is rich for us and gives us insight and understanding, so we'll consider looking at that. Uh, I might do some videos on this as well, kind of just uh, videos for those of you that would want to go deeper. Uh, I'm going to consider doing a video on the issues of Armageddon. Uh, Armageddon in the Bible, it's, you know, it's never used, the term's never used, the battle of Armageddon. Uh, we've used that term, and it's become kind of generic or symbolic. Even, you know, the culture has grabbed that, and it, it's uh, got a whole different meaning for so many different people. But really, in the Scripture, what's, what's described is a campaign. Uh, it's the great day of the Lord. It's the battle uh, that he comes to uh, bring an end to the rule of the Antichrist, the, this uh, opposition of the world to him. And so that's campaign. It's a series of battles. Uh, and, and it's really a battle might be inappropriate to term it that because there's no fight. Uh, Jesus is completely authoritative over that. Uh, that might be a separate, I might do that just as a video because a lot of you are already glassy-eyed as I'm looking and talking about it. <laughs> so there might be two or three of you that want to watch that video. So there's a lot here, right? There's just a lot going on. What we note is... Uh, we step out of 18, and we talked about this last week, at the fall of this Babylon system, uh, a mystery Babylon as it's described, this system that really is this intertwined, connected uh, world system, the Antichrist system, that is religious in one aspect, uh, in another aspect it's political, in another aspect it's economical, it's all intertwined, and I think that's part of the mystery. Who would have thought, right, in this age of secularism, in this age uh, of agnostic or atheist, or that, uh, that it would all end in this false religion, in this false pursuit of a false god, right, all that kind of stuff, uh, that it would all be intertwined with the, uh, the corporate pressures of the world, and we even see that stirring now, uh, and, and as well, uh, the, the political control, and we see those things rising, the uh, more and more control that they have uh, over us, and so all of that, Babylon rising, uh, but here in Revelation, we see it finally coming to an end, and it falls. And when it falls, it falls in a great fashion. Uh, described here, but also in the Old Testament, similar uh, description from Jeremiah, uh, where the, here in Revelation 18, it's described as a millstone thrown into the waters, right? Thrown into the sea. And how quickly you can visualize it, see that, a big, giant, heavy millstone thrown into the sea, and it don't float. You know what I'm saying? I know my English is incorrect there, but it doesn't float, right? It sinks immediately, and it's gone. There might be a little while where there's a ripple and a, uh, you know, that going, but then it, the, the sea settles back down, and you don't even know it's here. That's how Babylon's going to fall. <laughs> so quick and complete. 
and the kings of the world wail, weep and wail. <laughs> the merchants of the world weep and wail. The transporters, right, the ships, the, the trains, the, the shipping of the world, they weep and they wail at the fall of Babylon. This is after every tragic life lost and tragic climactic things happening, things disturbing, you know, overwhelming, great earthquakes, the whole world, stars falling from the sky. This is the first time we see the weeping and wailing of the world. They wail and weep because the, the Babylon system has fallen, the Antichrist system has fallen. No more money, no more business, no more control, no more, you know, all, that kind of, all of that gone. And they weep and wail. But you step into chapter 19, and from heaven's perspective, uh, there's no weeping and wailing in heaven. There's celebration and there's joy. And so we step into 19 and the perspective, no longer an earthly, worldly perspective, but a heavenly perspective where the church is, where the believers are, where the saints are up in the heavens. They're looking down and they're rejoicing. As we step into this, uh, there is a fourfold hallelujah in chapter 19. There will be four hallelujahs, and you want to pay attention to those. Uh, the heavens crying out with hallelujah. Right, right, the word hallelujah is a, a compound word. It's two words combined. Uh, halal, uh, we have the halal psalms. We have uh, the praise psalms. It means to praise. It means to shine. Uh, and it means uh, serious praise, like emotional uh, uh, very involved. There's even an aspect of this uh, idea of halal, this praise, uh, that can even be described as foolish. Remember David and how he worshiped the Lord? Uh, there's even an aspect of that. So this praise is all in, all out, right? It's this expressive praise, right? Uh, so it's praise, hala, halal, and the last part of that is yah, uh, and that is the abbreviated name of Yahweh. Uh, many take that word to Jehovah, but you know that idea of Yah is God, so praise God, right? And it is this all-in, all-out praise and worship to the Lord. It'll be loud in heaven, <laughs> right? And so we're stepping into that scene, right? So uh, this reality, this fourfold reality, this fourfold hallelujah uh, being expressed, and as we read this, uh, can I just remind you and connect you to this. Please be very sensitive to this in this moment as the as a church, as the church, as the believers, as the redeemed, bought and paid for. We've been bought and paid for, rescued by the blood of Christ. We belong to him. We've given our hearts to him. We trust him. We're the family of God. We're the body of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. We will be present in this chapter. I love that. Yes. Haven't you ever read the New Testament, like the gospel stories, and just like Jesus feeding the 5,000, and you felt like, oh, I wish I was there. I don't, wonder what, I don't like fish, but that fish, I bet you that was good, right? You know, it's like, right? It's all that, you know, those experiences, just seeing Jesus. And so here's a moment where you will be there. Yeah. Right, honestly, you should be stirred by the Holy Spirit. Just invite him to open this up to you, to open your eyes and to just put a thrill in your heart. We're headed to this. Right? You're part of this. You're gonna. You're being voiced here. You're. You're gonna. Your voice is gonna be part of this praise. I mean, that's really bump, scoop, uh, Holy Spirit bumps. That's what I was trying to say. You know, just a chill. Oh, you know, it's a, it should really excite you. Verse one. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. Do you hear that? Great multitude. You're part of that. Saying, "Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God." For righteous, I'm sorry, for true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot, Babylon, who corrupted the earth with her fornication and has avenged on her the blood of the servants shed by her. Oh, pause there, the first hallelujah. This worship and praise, right? Uh, very important. As we've looked at these chapters, we've recognized this. Uh, what's proclaimed here of the judgments of God is that they are righteous and true. Remind yourself that throughout 
the book of Revelation, what we've seen is that the Antichrist is persecuting those that have turned to Christ, those that have rejected the mark of the beast, those who refuse the Antichrist and accept Jesus Christ, they will be persecuted. A great majority of them, most of them, will be beheaded. And they arrive on heaven's shores. They arrive in heaven, and they are asking, Lord, how long till you avenge? Lord, how long? Finally, right? This is where it happens. This is where the avenge has happened. The vengeance has happened. Remember that. And in a real sense, you pause it, and we live in a time where Babylon rising, and you know, all the way back in the time of John, uh, as he wrote, he talked about the spirit of the Antichrist is here. Uh, the system has been being put together throughout the ages. We've seen this happening. We see it on the rise. We recognize it. Uh, there is a sense that all of us have been, have been wounded and affected and hurted. There have been believers that have been martyred throughout the ages because of the spirit of the Antichrist. There's a real sense that not just the idea of the judgment needed and required for this time period of seven years in Revelation, uh, but really the effect of the Antichrist spirit uh, throughout the ages, all of that's going to become to come to this place where justice has arrived. All those times you felt like, well, is there any justice? Is there going to ever be anything that's fair? Uh, even this week, have we not seen uh, how corrupt the system is? Uh, in multitudes of aspects uh, of the system is corrupt. And we wonder, is there any, d does the uh, regular guy have any hope? Is there any, and not only that, but the things that have affected you throughout the years the ways that uh, life is hurt, that the, you've been wounded uh, and abused and a victim and, and hurt by you know, the bullies of life, the, uh, the experiences of life. Uh, you recognize this. What's being proclaimed here is that what God has told us again and again, repeated in scriptures, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Justice is coming. <laughs> in, in a real sense, can you back up and recognize this? For us as believers... Uh, there, are, there are two paths to justice that will occur. Uh, one has already occurred, and you've made this choice to follow this path of justice. It's the justice that was poured out on Jesus Christ. See, because there was justice headed my way, the punishment that I deserved, what I had uh, done on my own, the wages of sin is death. All that I had collected and accumulated in my rebellion, in my selfishness, in my sin, uh, Jesus Christ went to the cross, stood in my place, was a substitute for me, and he not only paid the, uh, paid the full requirement uh, of God by living a perfect life, but he also gave his life and, and took the punishment, paid the price for my sins, erased my debt, Justice was poured out on him on behalf of me. It's wise to choose that path because at that place, justice was served. All that you had earned in punishment and wrath of God was satisfied on Jesus. And not only that, but recognize this as well. Every curse is broken there. Every wound is healed there. Every need is met there at the cross. You're experiencing that now. It'll come to its fulfillment in these things. Uh, but recognize this, all that, in that moment, uh, this is why the heavens, this is why the church, this is why all the occupants of heaven will proclaim, hallelujah, it's done, <laughs> finally, right? That sense. Oh, the, 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 the relief, right? Oh, it, it, the joy. Now, as this is proclaimed, the next hallelujah comes, and Again, they said, verse 3, hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God uh, who sat on the throne saying, amen and hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all you, his servants, and all who, those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of the great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns, all-powerful, right? All-potent, right? Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. 
And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So in these last three hallelujahs, you know, you, you look at these, and each one dramatic, each one uh, your presence, you'll be there. The church will be there. We'll be proclaiming these things, proclaiming that he's just and good. The, the fall of Babylon, uh, the aspects of Babylon, not only the, uh, some call it the ecclesiastical or the religious, but the false religion of the Antichrist, that falls, hallelujah. The economic, the government, the, the control uh, the, the pressure of all that, uh, the injustice of all that, that falls. Hallelujah. And then worship directed toward God himself. Uh, the throne room, right? From the throne room, a voice saying, praise the Lord, right? Uh, one of the commentators, one of the pastors I listened to uh, said, you ever been to, you know, one of those motivational rallies, you know, maybe for work or those, and there'll be that thing where they're trying to pump you up and get you to cheer and, and, and the the guy up front will say something like, I can't hear you, right? And all the more you get, you know, it's that kind of, from, from the throne room of God, there's going to be this moment where it's like, I can't hear you. you know, it's like, it's going to be, all right, now praise the Lord. Praise God himself because he's all powerful, because he's good, because he's done these things, right? This hallelujah, right? It's just going to be louder and more joyful and more and more expressive, that reality. And as you see this, it comes to this last portion or the last of the fourfold, hallelujah, and it is for the marriage of the Lamb. <laughs> now, I'll back up a little bit here and just note this. Uh, the word hallelujah, very familiar to us as religious people. Uh, it is, uh, as we've already discussed, it's one of those rare moments uh, where it's, a, it's specifically a Hebrew word, uh, and rare moments in the sense that the New Testament is given to us in Greek. Uh, so this Hebrew word comes through, uh, some of your translations have it with an H. That's the dir you know, direct Hebrew word. Some of your translations have it without the H, and they have it with the A. Uh, and uh, that's how I pronounce I, I can't say my H's. But anyways, uh, I, I often drop my H's like, uh, you know, just it annoys some of you. That's, uh, so in the Greek, the H is dropped, right? That's the sense of this. But it's, this is the first time we have the, this word in the New Testament. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Right? It's, a, it's an Old Testament word. It's all through the Psalms right? and the expression of the Psalms. But here, four times you have hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, it's a very Jewish book, <laughs> uh, the book of Revelation. It's about the, the rescue, the salvation of the Jewish people. right? And, uh, and here the bride of Christ being brought forward and the proclamation of hallelujah. Now, we'll look at this in depth uh, as the Lord allows in weeks to come. We'll look at the Jewish wedding and the, uh, the ways that... Jesus points to that and the fulfillment of that, the traditions of the Jewish wedding. Uh, some of us, we back earlier in the summer, we had a, a movie night where we watched a movie that goes through this. Um, and right at the moment, it's slipping my mind. What? Before the wrath, right? And it's a, it's a kind of a documentary uh, that sets up in, in different pastors they talk to and so forth that go through the description of the Jewish wedding. Uh, so before the wrath, uh, if you want to look that up and uh, find that on the internet, it might have a cost to it and so forth. But we're also going to be doing a study on, on that in the weeks to come. So just powerful uh, reality here, the marriage of the Lamb. Now, in the midst of this, uh, we want to back up and look at another aspect that uh, as you're looking at the marriage of the Lamb, I want you to pay attention that in verse 7, it says uh, that his wife has made herself ready. Uh, you know, to stop and to use the visual, and it is in our culture today, so uh, it's, a, it's a bit uh, of a similar experience with weddings, not the Jewish experience necessarily or the New Testament experience necessarily, uh, but we can even still relate to this and that, that that anticipation of the bride. Right, and how a bride will plan for her wedding. And, and uh, you know, there's ways that, you know, there's sometimes that you can meet a little girl that's already planning her wedding, right? Uh, you, you know, very young age, already has it all mapped out and Prince Charming arriving and all those things, right? You know, that, those scenes. Are, you know, but there's just that sense is that a wedding approaches, uh, a, a, a bride is getting ready, right? And, and I've shared this with you as a pastor doing premar premarital counseling, 
if I have a couple sitting in front of me and I have a bride that really doesn't care and doesn't, you know, is not excited and is, isn't anticipating, is not planning and getting ready, that for me is a concern. And that's just not normal, normal, right? You should be a little bit excited about what's going to be taking place. You should be, you know, planning and getting ready, right? There should be something of that, right? How many uh, in groups included in this, but how many of us are trying to drop weight before the wedding, right? How many of us are going on special diets and refusing the foods that we love and, you know, exercising more and, you know, sacrificing and doing things necessary to get ready and to look good for the wedding, right? How many of us do that? Uh, how many of us uh, know the experience of interviewing photographers and, uh, you, you know, and making sure that you have somebody that can take a decent picture? You know, do you, do you have the filter that slims? Do you have that one? That's what I, you know, do you have, can you Photoshop, just drop you know, the, the, you know the, you're just concerned about that. And, and here, this, this is just a hint. I, I, think that these, I think that these characteristics of us, right, these, these things that we have in our heart, the things that we want and yearn for, I think there's a way that many of those things, uh, uh, are, there's a righteous aspect of that, right? Oh, there's ways the world can twist and turn and take our places, take, take us to selfish places or even dark places. But if you bring those uh, desires to the purity, right, to, to righteousness, and you run it through the heart of Christ, you begin to look at that, and there's a real sense that, that, that those aspects of the worldly weddings, the things that we've been experiencing, the things, even the places where you've experienced the wedding, you've been a bride, you've been a groom, the anticipation, the excitement, all those kind of things, it's just this foreshadowing, it's this hint of what's available in Christ, what's going to take place in Christ, all the more, so much more, to the, to the point where we don't fully grasp and understand this, uh, but the, the joy, uh, the excitement, the anticipation of a wedding, uh, it, it points us to what God has even more so available to us. Church, we, the bride of Christ, should be anticipating, excited, we should be getting ready. But there's something more to this. Because on our own, we're not able to get ready. On our own, we're not equipped. We're, we don't have it in us. Uh, we don't have the, uh, uh, the endurance, the focus. Uh, we get distracted. We get de delayed. We get detoured, all that kind of stuff. We need help in this. And here comes the servant of the Lord, uh, the comforter, the work of the Holy Spirit. Oh, and, and he comes and he brings the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he empowers and he enables. And in the, the work of leading us into the things of Christ, the truth of Christ, he opens up the richness of Christ and he brings it forward. And the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the sanctifying work of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden this, this getting ready is not just on us, right? Where we would disappoint or we wouldn't follow through. Now we have the assistance of the Holy Spirit. All right, that's just dramatic. And as you look at this, uh, you want to note this because it says the, his wife has made herself ready. And then verse 8 says, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. All right, now here, here's your part in this. There's something to this. Uh, what we do for the Lord will be brought forth in this beautiful moment, will be brought forth in glory. It'll be brought forth. And so this is why we're encouraged so often uh, to live for the Lord, right? And, and, it, and it's not just for the, uh, you know, the pastors to do. And it's not just, you know, like for the big names, you know, like Billy Graham and, you know, the, the big things and the big events and the big thing, you know, dramatic things that happen in the kingdom or in the church. It's not just that. It's all the way down to the small things. In fact, uh, these small things that are, are more often overlooked, uh, just simply in your home, uh, being a servant of the Lord, right? Considering how you can stir up love and good works in others, right? And, 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 uh, you know, I, I have been made fun of for this, but th this is true. You can do anything for the Lord. You can do the dishes for the Lord. You can do laundry for the Lord. You can scrub toilets for the Lord. You can pick up garbage for the Lord. You do it for the Lord. And, and here's the thing. It's key. Like, if, you know, if you're doing it and you're going, like, stupid kid, why don't you? I'll tell you what, this is a truth. Laundry never ends. It's a never-ending, you, know, well, you know, mother's work is never, if that's, you know, and dad's too. You know, it's, it, you know that if you're doing it like that, oh, God, that might not show up on this day. 
You don't want it to, right? What's our righteousness look like? Filthy rags. And that's a really strong phrase. We don't need to go into, but you know, uh, the, it compares to this. These, this garment, the, the, not filthy rags, glorious, right? And so there's this sense that if you serve the Lord and all that you do, whatever you do, whatever you do, do it for the Lord. You go with me, if you would, to Ephesians. And uh, if you uh, have struggles finding the scriptures, you can just camp right there in Revelation and listen in. But if you're able, go back to the uh, book of Ephesians. Go to chapter 2. This is what's amazing to me, right? Here's another thing that happens at weddings. I've experienced both sides of this. Uh, you know, the, the bride finds her wedding dress, and, uh, and, you know, she finds it. She falls in love with, love with it. She picks it. She chooses it. And then the last stage is then you look at the price tag, right? Then that, and, then, and then the father goes, it's how, how much? It's how much? Right? Can we rent it? <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, is there another way? You know, it's like, right, so the wedding dress, right, it's, uh, it's like often an obstacle of how, how are we going to afford that? We'll have to choose another one, all those kind of things. But here with Christ, look at what happens uh, in Ephesians chapter 2. You know the, the text, verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship. And remember, that's a word that we have, poema. We get the word poem. It's the idea of craftsmanship. He gives all his attention, detail. Uh, it, it is a work of art. You are his, we are his work of the church, the bride of Christ. All of us get together, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Remember what good works will end up being? It'll be your attire on the wedding day, right? And uh, those good works were prepared beforehand, in advance, that we should walk in them. So church, right? And you got things to do that I can't do, that, I, that don't come across my, uh, for me as opportunities. You have things that you can do that are unique to you, and, and you'll bring forth. And, and God's already in advance giving you those things in Christ. And, and along with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and the help of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, to do these things in him. And then look at chapter 5 of this same book. And remember what Christ does. And this goes back more and more to the Jewish culture and the Jewish wedding. And you note this. In verse 25 of Ephesians chapter 5, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church. And so there's great encouragement there for husbands and how we're to love and sacrificial and giving ourselves up for our wife. But here today we're looking for the sake of how does Jesus love his church? And look at what he does. He's, he's not only laid his life down for her, verse 25, now 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church. Now, when does that happen? <laughs> right In the heavens, when we see the Lord face to face, that scene of Revelation 19, the, the beauty of the church brought forth, right? Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Jesus is doing that right now, right? Just amazing. He's washing us with the water of the word, even what we're doing right now. He's washing over us uh, the added work of the Holy Spirit in the word of God, the power of this. This is the love of Christ, and he's getting you ready. And there's going to be a day where you will be presented, not just you, but all of us. And I so often do this. We often do this. We talk about the bride of Christ and in that imagery, and we think of just personal, right? And there is that aspect, but we also have to understand and recognize collectively, congregationally, all of us can, can come to, coming together in the work of God, uh, built together, and we're going to be brought together in such a way that we're going to be brought forth in the beauty and glory of Jesus Christ and his grace. And in that moment, the world will be stunned. You did that with them. Our testimony, right? The beauty of what God has done. Uh, this reality. Now, as you uh, take those thoughts back to Revelation, we're obviously going to have to make this a multi-part series. Uh, Revelation 19, this is as far as we'll get. 
uh, to this moment. We just want to set the context here. Uh, the next verse says, uh, Revelation 19, verse 9 is where I'm picking up. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to be uh, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, blessed are those who are invited, some of the translations say. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Now, as you recognize this, listen, the, the bride doesn't receive an invitation to the wedding, right? So the bride is the you know, guest of honor in a sense. She's the focal point, I guess. Uh, she's part of the wedding. It's her event. It's her and the groom's event. And so that event of the wedding supper of the Lamb, there will be those that are invited. Uh, the invitation, blessed are those that are invited, that's not something the church receives. Uh, that's uh, the Old Testament saints, and that's the saints, the tribulation saints. Uh, the bride is already there, already part of this wedding. Now, as you look at this, we're going to close with this thought. The worship team's going to come up and close us in uh, worship this, this morning. Uh, I want you to turn with me to uh, Isaiah. We just finished the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah is so closely united uh, with uh, the things we've been reading in, in Revelation. And when you look at Isaiah 66, verse 12, is where we'll close with this imagery. In this uh, section of Revelation, we're studying the bride of Christ, the wedding supper of the Lamb. This great celebration is going to be coming forth. Uh, the world will be made new. It'll be a new beginning. It'll be the rule and reign of Christ. It's the thousand-year reign. As you look at this new Jerusalem, Jerusalem will be established. Uh, Jesus Christ will sit on the throne. He'll rule and reign from Jerusalem. We'll have a, we'll be, as the church will be in his presence, we'll be uh, in the new Jerusalem, our abode, but we'll be ruling and reigning with Christ on the earth. All those kind of things going on. Uh, it'll be a brand new, redeemed, righteous uh, reality of the millennial reign. It'll begin with the wedding supper, the celebration, uh, the, the wedding feast. It'll begin with that. During our study of Revelation, the church has been going through this process. Right, We're in, uh, in this consideration of Revelation. We're taken up in the rapture. We're prepared. We're, we're brought forth and we're prepared for this wedding. Uh, you notice that the aspects of this preparation is the church has made herself ready right, and has been granted to her. Those are things that happen while Revelation, the seven years, is going on. The Bema Seat, uh, the judgment where we're brought forth and God begins to reward us. Jesus begins to reward us. And he's going to begin to do things and to, when you personally are there before Christ. And he's, begin, he's going to begin to reveal the things that you did for him. You're going to be in that moment shocked at what he brings forth. You're going to be stunned and amazed and overwhelmed at his generosity. In the Old Testament, Isaiah tells us, ashes for beauty. Uh, in our stories, we have this, you know, the, uh, the dull, the, the uh, uh, ugly, the uh, imperfect being brought into a place of beauty. Cinderella, right, that scene of Cinderella, uh, it, it has aspects of that, where she's the poor handmaid, where she's the, the servant girl, where she's uh, dirty and gruff and scrubbing the floors, and then that one moment, right, and she puts on a dazzling, and her beauty is brought forth. That moment... God's going to uh, take you through that beam of seed experience and all the things that are ugly, all the things that are selfish, all the things of the flesh, all that stripped away. We're in our glorified bodies, that experience, and he's going to begin to bring forth the things that you did for him. All the things that you did for other reasons, those, those will be uh, burned away, gone, but will be brought forth. It won't be a place of guilt and regret in that sense. You're going to be amazed at his generosity. And you're going to, he's going to bring forth things. And you're, I don't remember doing that. I don't remember that. You, you reward that. I did. You, and you're just going to be. Uh, uh, it's going to be that experience. And the, it's going to be granted to you to adorn yourself. All those things redeemed. All those things brought through the love of Christ. The grace of Christ. You're going to adore your, adorn yourself in the beauty. And the bride's going to be brought forth. And Jerusalem is going to be reset. Isaiah 66 verse 12. Behold I will extend peace to her like a river. 
in the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then you shall feed on her sides, uh, shall you be carried, and on her dandle, be dandled on her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city of peace, uh, the scene of the wedding, uh, the, the wedding feast. After we've been married to Christ, we'll be brought forth, introduced publicly, and those invited will come and celebrate what Christ has done. In this moment, the city of Jerusalem, that has been a place of war throughout history, will finally be the city of peace. And God's going to comfort his people, and we'll be in there in the midst of this. It's like a mother picking up her child and holding her child on her hip uh, and letting that child rest and play on her lap uh, and comforting that child and feeding that child. Uh, that experience of comfort that a child receives, a little baby receiving from her mom, God's going to comfort like that. That's the scene. Peace like a river. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Let's get ready, right? I'm so ready. Holy Spirit, do your work. Lord, don't you want to invite people to this? This is the time to be a part of the bride, right? You still have time to be part of the bride, right? If you've never trusted Christ, now's the time, right? He's made a way for you to be uh, beloved. Uh, would you turn to him this morning? Fresh and new. Let's celebrate. Let's church. Let's be ready. Worship team is going to close us uh, with one last song. Let's worship. Let's praise. Let's say hallelujah. Let's get ready. Come weary and tired and worn out from Step out of the shadows and walk into light. Come sin or sing, slave man or free. Bring blessings and offerings, then you will see. Bring blessings and offerings, then There is a peace to settle your soul. There is a peace that's calling you home. You've been tempted and shaken, tested and failed. You've been so far from Jesus and too close to hell. Your vision's been clouded by this world's delight. But I tell you, you're not of this world, so stand up and fight. No, you're not of this world, so stand up and fight. There is a peace to settle your soul. There is a peace that's calling you home. There is a peace to settle.
Let's just have a moment of quiet and uh, let that peace settle, these truths, let them settle in your heart right now. Father, we thank you that this is our hope, uh, that we have this to look forward to, Lord, that we're going to be a part of this, this great celebration, this great uh, reality, these moments of praise and worship, this experience uh, of the wedding of the bride of Christ uh, uh, to Jesus Christ, that moment of uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb, Lord, we can't wait. We look forward to that. Lord, would you stir the bride? Would you bring an anticipation, an excitement, an expectation, an eagerness? Lord, we want to avail ourselves not only to the things that you've prepared in advance, but to the empowering of the Holy Spirit, the help and the aid and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. We need you. Lord, we want to avail ourselves to the word, and we want to ask, Jesus, would you wash us in the water of your word? Lord, it's so good to rely on you, on your love for us. Lord, you're good at this. You know what you're doing. You know what we need. Lord, would you cleanse us and prepare us? and work through the word, work through your Holy Spirit, and stir our hearts to live for Christ. <laughs> and whatever we do, to do it for Jesus. Lord, get your bride ready. <laughs> or we can't wait. Or we, we come together and we study these things, and we might have different perspectives, maybe a little different opinion or nuance. Or, uh, Lord, don't let those things get in the way. All of us can be excited about this, Lord. And if there's anybody here, and let me speak to you right now, if you feel a little distant or foreign to this, listen, right now you're being invited. And you sense this, and you know this, that Jesus Christ loves you, and he's loved you this much and that he's died for you. He's made a way for you to be beloved, to be brought in. You can be a part of this. There's hope in Christ. So would today be that moment where you surrender to Jesus, that you bow to him that you humble yourself. You recognize the sin, the selfishness, the rebellion, the, the ways that you've been stubborn. You recognize that. Admit that. Lay it before him. Ask him to forgive you. And trust your life to him. Turn away from all that stuff and turn to Jesus. Make a change. Repent. Follow him today. Make that your prayer right now. Surrender to him. Bow to him right now. And if it's been a while, if you feel like you've fallen away from that, come back. If you need help with this today, we'll be here to pray with you. We want to pray with you. We want to help you with that. Uh, let us know that you made these decisions. Uh, there's New Believer Bibles up here. If you don't have a Bible, grab one of those. Father, we give you all these things. Holy Spirit, would you complete this work? Oh, so glad that you do. Lord, uh, pour out your Spirit in this place on these people on those watching, Lord, pour out your spirit. Fill us and empower us. Bring forth the fruit of the spirit. Give us the gifts of the spirit. And let us be, Lord, uh, the hope extended to this world. The rescue team. Help us to reach the lost in these days. Lord, help us to invite many uh, 
uh, to come be part of the bride. Uh, we give you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.